So I want to start with a model of a company's R&D process. And I want to start here because I, I'm going to argue in a minute that it's changing, but it's helpful to understand where we've been to understand kind of where we're going. I'm representing it here by a funnel turned on its side. And the idea is that a company launches its science and technology projects from its science and technology base into this funnel. And in the beginning, it's quite wide and a lot of things are investigated, but pretty soon it gets narrowed down and a very much smaller portion are taken through to the market. So we start much more than we finish. Uh, and you'll notice I call this a closed innovation system. And the reason I call it closed is it has the property of there's only one way into this process, which is at the beginning stages, and there's only one way out of this process, and that's into the market. And all the other stuff we do that doesn't get out to the market kind of ends up getting stuck on the shelf. Keep that in mind, because we're going to liberate that stuff in just a few moments. So the way you manage in this kind of an environment is you give them money and you leave them alone. It's kind of the heroic inventor model. And you've got the old expression from the days of early 20th century from Harvard, and yes, he did say him, but the more recent modern expression from Alan Kay, a respected computer scientist, is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Uh, these are all sort of fundamentally perspectives that from this, out of this basis, and indeed it's had some great successes, such as the discovery of the transistor at AT&T Bell Labs in uh, 1948 with Britton, Bardeen, and Shockley. And if you look at these R&D centers, here's AT&T's Bell Labs on the left, IBM Watson Lab on the right, these are fortresses of knowledge surrounded and cut off really from the outside world, but very, very rich interior discussions going on inside. So even architecturally, you can see some of the closed aspects of this. Well, now I want to argue why this has begun to change. And I don't have a lot of time to develop this, so I'm going to hit a couple of key points. These are data from the National Science Foundation on companies and R&D spending. And I've organized these data by the size of the company doing the spending. So back in 1981, about 70% of the R&D spending done in that year was done by companies of more than 25,000 employees. In that same year, the smallest companies, all added together, were less than 5% of the R&D spending. And this is consistent with this era of these very large environments where in order to be effective and competitive, you had to be big. But now roll forward in time to the most recent data, from the survey in 2007, and you'll find that the largest companies, though they haven't gone away, are only about 35% of the R&D spending done in 2007. And those smallest companies of less than 1,000 employees together are now nearly a quarter of all the R&D spending. So there's really been a shift in where R&D is happening, and I, as I argue in the title, uh, they're diminishing economies of scale being shown here. You don't necessarily have to be big to be good. And so companies like Merck are reaching the conclusion that, hey, there's too much happening in the science, in the technology, in the, the knowledge bases from which we draw ideas to launch new products. We can't do it all ourselves. We've got to open up and tap into all the other stuff going on out there. Uh, another more pithy way to say it is what Bill Joy said, Berkeley grad, founder of Sun, these days a partner at Kleiner Perkins Venture Capital Fund. So an interesting career progression himself, not all the smart people work for you. That means you and your smart people need to go find and connect to and make use of all the other smart people that are out there. And that means we need a very different kind of an innovation model, a model that I call open innovation, which again starts with a funnel aimed at its current market, but now we drill holes in that funnel so that things can flow in and out throughout the R&D process. And now we get all these different pathways for how ideas and projects and technologies can go into the market. So all that stuff that we used to start but didn't make it through and had no other place to go, now that has other pathways to go out into the market as well. So we still want to advance our businesses, 
but we can also enable and benefit from advancing other businesses as well, just as they too can benefit from collaborating with us and bring ideas for us to use in our business. That's the idea of open innovation in a nutshell. So does this mean that internal R&D becomes obsolete? Definitely not. This is a model of leveraging what you already have internally. It's not a model of getting rid of it, outsourcing it to a whole bunch of other people. It does, however, have me a new meaning for what R&D has to do. It's no longer sufficient to simply be in those castles and fortresses of knowledge developing your own stuff. You've really got to be connected and engaged and collaborating with other people in their stuff as well. And indeed, this new skill of how to integrate together the external with the internal, that systems integration or systems architecture, systems kind of thinking, becomes a new and really valuable, critical skill for the new R&D approach of open innovation. So now let's try to ex give you an example of how this might work in the context of climate change. And you remember back to last November and December where we had the Copenhagen discussions that really came out in a pretty disappointing conclusion. And as you recall, the main issue was around emissions targets, but there was a second level of issues, which is if this is all going to really happen, the developing world's going to need access to a lot of technology and a lot of intellectual property from the developed world in order to be able to grow their economies but grow them in a way that's more green, that's more energy efficient, uh, that's more sustainable. How is that going to happen? How are the ideas, the technologies going to get from the developed world to the developing world? The developing world isn't about to go pay full market price for all of these. They can't afford to do that. And the companies in the developed world who have these technologies, while they would like to see them used, aren't necessarily going to simply give them away without some form of compensation of some kind. And this became an important second issue in these discussions. There were some proposals floated to create a pool of funds to transfer these technologies and try to solve some of this. But given the financial crises we've been in, it hasn't been the right time for that approach. So the obvious question is, could open innovation help here? And the short answer is, as you might guess, yes, which is why I'm here on the stage talking to you. There are other approaches out there trying to connect and enable sharing of green and sustainable technologies. I show you here one from the EcoPatent Commons, which is trying to do some very good things. But if you look over the arc of what they've tried, over the last couple of years, they haven't unleashed a lot of patents yet. And this is one of these things where for these kinds of mechanisms to work, you need a lot of technology and IP available, and then a lot of people looking to use it. And these kinds of two-sided markets need both a lot of supply and a lot of demand before their magic really starts to work. This isn't yet seeming to get to critical mass. So the idea was, let's create something that might take a different open innovation approach to that, and that's where the green exchange comes into play. And the idea here is companies that are in business have a number of patents that might have green or sustainable uses, but they're typically a small portion of their overall portfolio. And most of these companies don't have a lot of processes to do anything with these technologies outside of using them in their own business. So we have a lot of stuff that's sort of in that funnel, not being used in its own market, and certainly not being used outside. But this is kind of the raw material that the green exchange can work with. And so the idea is let's focus on the sustainability percentage of those patents and then recognize that they're not all equal. Some patents are truly core to your business, core to your differentiation against your most direct competitors. These are the, the patents you probably want to be fairly careful with, whereas there are a whole bunch of other patents that aren't that way, and indeed you'd manage them differently if you group them into these three buckets. The ones that are truly core you would guard very closely. The ones that are important to your supply chain, to your ecosystem, to your partners, collaborators, you'd want to share with them perhaps selectively. And then other patents that, aren't, that are in neither of those categories are candidates to be shared very broadly. So you start to discriminate and differentiate in thinking about these different approaches to dealing with it. And what the Green Exchange does, based on some collaboration with Science Commons, is create some standard templates through which technologies that are in that selective group 
or that broadly shared group can be specified in advance. So anybody who wants to use these technologies can go to the site, see the technology, see the terms on which the company who is contributing it is willing to share it. And this transparency really helps advance getting the people who need these technologies connected to the people who have them. Because you don't have to hire brokers and attorneys and go through a very difficult sorting process to find each other. Through this much more transparent process, it's very easy to search and see on what terms it's available. From the perspective of the company contributing, you get to determine the terms on which it's shared. Some of it could be shared with everybody. Others could be shared much more selectively. Still others could be only on a revenue basis and only by prior approval, et cetera. So you can really gauge the degree of collaboration you want with these green sustainable technologies that you possess. And the hope is that this will unlock more participation by the companies who have these technologies, precisely because the businesses don't lose control of the IP, but they, we want them to think about it strategically. So I think I've just said most of this, except for perhaps the last part, that you can specify specific exemptions for which you are willing to license, or if you prefer, conditions under which you would not. So what are the business benefits of this? Why would this be a good idea for companies? Well, the basic idea, argument here is good business. It's not simply publicity or greenwashing or these other ephemeral benefits, but these are things that could deliver real bottom line value to your business. For example, if some of the technologies in your supply chain get used more widely, that could actually lower not only the social and environmental costs, it could also lower your direct purchasing costs of those technologies. Uh, if you're able to establish some technical standards that can be followed by a wide number of companies, that could even invite new companies or new initiatives to come in, and that will enrich the environment from which you draw inputs to your business. Of course, in some cases, you may specify that these are going to have royalties attached to them, in which case incremental new revenue would come into you from sharing this. And of course, you can also use this to stimulate a lot more research in areas that are important to your business, and you want to see more possibilities, more opportunities in the future. So as I hope I've explained to you, there are some private reasons why companies would want to do this. Best of all, we don't need government to take action to figure this out. It would certainly help, but it's not required. This, can, this is already getting going, and even with the disappointments of Copenhagen and the like, this is something I think that can be sustained with or without more proactive government policy. It also means the developing nations need not pay for all of those IP rights because they may not want to use them in all industries. They may want to use them in one geography for one industry or simply doing research, et cetera. These are things that it can pay only for what they need rather than for the whole package. And of course, those same nations are going to innovate themselves. And when they come up with new breakthroughs, those can indeed also go back to the green exchange for sharing and licensing with others. So that's the idea of this idea of open innovation. There will also, again, be a book signing after lunch as well. And thanks very much for your attention.